Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming uh, to this conference on liberals and libertarians, common ground or separate agendas. Uh, this uh, was really a brainchild of, of uh, Brink Lindsay and myself. Uh, I was uh, minding my own business in my office one day, and I got an email from Brink saying, I read your book on liberalism. And, uh, and he gave me a whole list of comments and sent me uh, his books. So I read his books and uh, made a whole list of comments. And we were surprised to discover that on many uh, uh, items, we uh, agreed with one another. And uh, I had always been asking the question, um, uh, uh, what are you, what, what's, the, what's with the libertarians hanging around with these Republicans when they're violating, systematically violating a uh, uh, number of your core principles? And so uh, we decided to uh, uh, organize this conference as a conversation to see, see what there is in common, see where the differences lie, and see where we are today. Um, uh, uh, for the liberal side, um, we have Christopher Hayes. He's the Washington, D.C. editor of The Nation and a fellow of the New America Foundation. He's published articles in The American Prospect, The New Republic, The Washington Monthly, and is a frequent uh, guest on um, Countdown with Keith Oberman. Uh, Paul Starrs, professor of sociology here at Princeton, and the Stewart Professor of Communications and Public Affairs. He is the founding editor of the American Prospect and the author of Freedom's Power, the History and Promise of Liberalism in the Creation of the Media. <clears throat> and uh, um, History and Power of Liberalism, and his second book is uh, the creation of the media, the political origins of modern communications. I will be the third uh, liberal um, professor of sociology and public affairs here at Princeton, and I wrote the book that attracted Brink's attention, Return of the L Word, a liberal <coughs> vision for the new century. Uh, I'll turn it over to Brink to say a few introductory uh, remarks on, on his behalf, and he'll introduce the libertarians, and then I will come back and briefly uh, uh, and introduce our discussants, and then we'll move right into the discussion uh, with, uh, uh, with um, uh, Paul Starr. Thanks, Doug. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here and to have this opportunity to, to do this event uh, with Doug. I think the fact that this uh, event got arranged and that it got arranged by uh, Doug Massey and myself is some evidence uh, of common ground between liberals and libertarians. Uh, what Doug didn't mention about uh, uh, my reading of his book, Return of the L Word, that particularly caught my eye was that uh, my employer, the Cato Institute, was prominently mentioned in his uh, list of the, uh, the various co-conspirators in the vast right-wing conspiracy. And so one of the things I contacted him about was saying, well, yeah, I don't really think we belong in that. Uh, listed a number of reasons why, and he said, well, you sort of do, and here's some reasons why. And uh, so we took our dialogue from there, and since then, uh, Doug has written papers for Cato and appeared in, uh, in uh, other Cato web magazine, Cato Unbound, uh, and was gracious enough to blurb my book. So we're a, we're a two-person start to the liberal libertarian dialogue, and we'd like to expand it from here. Representing Team Libertarian, besides myself, uh, is uh, Will Wilkinson, who's a research fellow at the Cato Institute and editor of the uh, uh, web magazine Cato Unbound, and Jacob Levy, uh, who's Tomlinson Professor of Political Theory at McGill University and who received his doctorate from here at Princeton. And uh, without further ado, Doug, you can start things up, and I think liberals go first, right? Well, before we move on to the liberals, let me tell you who our um, commentators and discussants are. Uh, officially billed as nonpartisan, um, they can uh, tell you otherwise uh, as they see fit. Um, Paul DiMaggio, here from the Sociology Department, he's Professor of Sociology and Public Affairs, um, and, and uh, he's done a lot of work on uh, cultural sociology, and in particular, uh, he's the author of a, a, a well-known um, uh, article on uh, social division in the United States, the disparity between private opinion and public politics, uh, which is very frequently cited, and uh, that was published in the, in the book uh, Fractious America, Divisions of Race, Culture, Politics, and the Millennium. Our other discussant is John Tomasi, who's professor of political science at Brown University and director of the Political Theory Project. He's author of Liberalism Beyond Justice, Citizen Society and the Boundaries of Political Theory. So without further ado, uh, Team Liberal with um, uh, Paul Starr. Well, good afternoon. 
Uh, I hadn't uh, realized that I was at the f to uh, make the first pitch of the afternoon, but uh, okay. Um, well, what do liberals and, and libertarians have in common? Well, we have in common the central importance of liberty as a value. And what do liberals and libertarians fundamentally disagree about? Well, we disagree about what liberty means and how to expand and protect it. Libertarians, it seems to me, are single-mindedly concerned with liberty from the power of government, whereas, liber whereas liberals properly see threats to liberty also emanating from concentrated private power and unregulated markets. And in order to limit those threats, citizens require government intervention of particular kinds, not a knee-jerk opposition to government altogether. And second, libertarians uh, give the highest, indeed often absolute, priority to property rights and accordingly to the rights of those with property, both individuals and corporations, whereas liberals give higher prior, prior, priority and broader scope to other constitutional liberties and civil rights, often those of the historically disadvantaged. Uh, third, modern liberalism has a concern uh, for mutual responsibility as well as liberty, and that concern grows out of an enlarged conception of rights. Rights imply correlative obligations. Rights of personal and civil liberty imply that we are individually accountable for our actions. I don't think we would disagree about that. Rights to political liberty imply a civic responsibility to make democracy work. We probably don't disagree about that. Uh, and, but rights to basic requirements of human development and a minimum standard of security imply that we have obligations to each other mutually and through our government to ensure the conditions uh, exist that enable every individual to live in dignity and have the opportunity for success in life. And I do think we disagree about that. The central liberal project I write in this book of mine, Freedom's Power, and I have some copies available for free if anybody would like one. Uh, the central liberal project I write is the effort to guarantee these freedoms and to create the institutions and forms of character that will lead a people to assume responsibility, not as an external burden imposed upon them, but from a force within. But alas, we cannot entirely rely on that force within. To assure those rights, we often need government to levy taxes and impose regulations that on balance expand liberty and protect other values. And that has been the achievement of a variety of modern liberal reforms, including, for example, Social Security and unemployment insurance. Now, these reforms did not sacrifice freedom for security. They successfully reconciled those values. So, for example, unemployment insurance and other elements of Social Security have helped citizens to preserve their personal independence as well as their dignity at moments when they are most vulnerable to becoming dependent, for example, guaranteeing a minimum livelihood in old age through taxes during one's working years, enables millions of the elderly to continue living in their own homes when they retire, uh, and that prevents them from becoming dependent on their children or from sinking into, the, into complete destitution. In other words, the value of those programs isn't just greater equality, it's liberty itself that those programs preserve, and in the most meaningful way. Social insurance programs also have the effect of protecting liberty in another way. By creating a buffer against economic insecurity, they encourage people to accept technological change, trade, and other sources of turbulence necessary for growth in a dynamic capitalist economy. These programs are stabilizers of the economy, automatic stabilizers, because when unemployment rises, they help to maintain demand and thereby contribute to recovery. In short, the programs don't undermine capitalism, they contribute to its survival, and in the long run, they help to maintain that system of uh, property-owning democracy, which libertarians uh, care about. 
Social security, however, presents one of the most dramatic differences that liberals have with libertarians these days. Libertarians I'm talking about who favored privatization, either in whole or part, through the shift of social security contributions into individual accounts. For the sake of our discussion, uh, I don't need to stress the practical difficulties of converting from our current social security system uh, to a system of uh, individual accounts. Um, uh, that would require uh, benefits to current uh, retirees uh, be funded uh, either by immediately increasing other taxes or more likely by increased federal borrowing. Uh, the Bush plan uh, would have had the government borrow more money from abroad, uh, ironically including China, so that individual workers could invest in the stock market. What a, what a brilliant idea that would have been. Now, since the market has crashed, and many workers who are retired or close to retirement have been anxiously looking at their diminished 401ks. Now imagine if they didn't have Social Security to fall back on, but had to depend entirely on shaky private investments. The libertarian strategy for retirement would be a disaster uh, for millions of people. A and the same is true uh, in another case uh, dear to me, that is the case of health insurance where many libertarians favor increased reliance again on individual health savings accounts. Now, that approach works nicely for young, healthy individuals, uh, particularly if they're, if they're in high tax brackets, uh, because they're unlikely to use the money deposited into those accounts in a year and can roll over the remainder tax-free, at least so long as they're healthy. But diverting the healthy into individual accounts leaves a relatively older and sicker population in group insurance raising their costs. And despite the short-term advantages for the young and healthy, individual insurance has by far the greatest uh, overhead costs. So it's really a net uh, increase in inefficiency. The libertarian bias against government blocks recognition of how healthcare financing works in practice. The private insurance market both as it exists or as it would exist under plans for expanded individual accounts, is phenomenally wasteful and inefficient. Administrative costs are far greater than under Medicare or under national health insurance programs in other countries. And those programs do not leave millions of people exposed to insecurity and personal bankruptcy, not to mention lack of medical care itself when illness strikes. The financial crisis should remind all of us about the limitations of laissez-faire capitalism and of libertarianism. Shorn of regulation, markets are unstable. And if that instability isn't corrected, the entire system is at risk. So if, as a libertarian, you want to keep a market economy, you have to recognize that government has a necessary role to play in softening its edges and maintaining the confidence that's essential for it to work. Liberals and libertarians share much of the same intellectual tradition. We share the same 18th century classical liberal lineage on our intellectual family tree, though we interpret the patrimony differently. For liberals, the great legacy is political, the commitment to constitutional rights, rather than the old economic liberalism with its emphasis on property rights. So there are philosophical differences between us. But I think there are also differences in the uh, understanding of historical experience, in the relation to historical experience. Liberals have drawn lessons from the experience of the past two centuries that it seems to me libertarians have not been willing to acknowledge. Now, liberal reforms have been imperfect, but neither democracy nor capitalism would still be around today without them. Um, <clears throat> since I'm not a, uh, an academic or a theorist, I thought uh, I, I am a political reporter, so I thought I would focus a little bit on the um, sort of pragmatic, more pragmatic nature of political coalitions at this moment um, and, and the possibility of liberal libertarian actual real world political coalition towards certain ends. Um, it's, it's obviously a very bizarre time in American politics, uh, tumultuous in the extreme. I found myself the other day on television involved in a bizarre disquisition on socialism, on whether uh, tax cuts uh, for 95% of the uh, households constituted socialism. Uh, 
this, this was within a week of the uh, United States government uh, nationalizing a portion of the banking industry. Um, and, you know, it, it was all very surreal. Um, so I, I, I say that uh, by means of saying that, that there is a lot up for grabs right now and that political coalitions are being um, torn apart and reformed, and we're seeing that in all sorts of very interesting ways. Um, in terms of this specific alliance between liberals and libertarians, I think one of the, the, the sources of the promise of it um, from the liberal side is some dem demographic changes, interestingly, uh, in the uh, liberal coalition, and particularly the activist base of the Democratic Party, which is referred to sometimes as the net roots, et cetera, which tends to be demographically um, professional, f f highly educated, kind of upper middle class constituency, what I've termed in other writing the bourgeois revolt. And uh, the ideological profile of many of these people is far more sympathetic, um, in some senses, to libertarianism than the profile of other elements of the democratic, uh, democratic base. So that, that, that provides one sort of concrete uh, change in the coalition that's, that's provided a, 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 the, the possibility of a bridge of, with libertarians. I myself uh, come from a tradition of a sort of uh, for lack of a better term, Catholic socialism. Um, and uh, remember in high school getting past, you guys have all probably seen that uh, online quiz uh, where, where you put in your ideology. And, and, and the point is to reveal to liberals and conservatives that libertarianism is the only truly consistent ideology. Have you seen that? It's a square and you get mapped along two axes, liberal and conservative and libertarian and authoritarian. So the idea is that, you know, you're either for state intervention in all cases or against state intervention. I was one of the rare people who actually ended up in the authoritarian quadrant, which I don't think anyone's actually supposed to end up into, but I felt quite consistent in my, um, my youthful Catholic socialism, which was... <laughs> um, and so because I think because of that affective uh, disposition, I have always been a little uh, wary of this political coalition. And that's changed quite a bit, actually, um, in my thinking and in my writing over the last eight years. And I think there's three three main reasons, the Bush administration in particular, and the Republican uh, rule uh, in Washington has, has provoked that. Uh, the first is the war. Um, from, from a very concrete political perspective, uh, the people who are fighting against the war, particularly on the left, liberals who are fighting against the war, found tremendous allies among libertarians. Um, and indeed, many of the uh, websites that were uh, opposing the war in the beginning were being run by uh, libertarians. A lot of the marches were um, involved coalition groups that had libertarians. And as the war has continued, and not just the war, but what I think is we can all agree is a tremendous growth in the national security state, um, that natural alliance, I think, has deepened on a lot of different issues that are part of generally um, a deep skepticism towards uh, enlargement of the state's power vis-a-vis -vis its military and security operations. So that's one place where I think there's a very distinct, uh, distinct amount of political common ground. And the way that things work in coalition politics is that points of political common ground begin as sort of ideological and then they become actually social. So you, you work together uh, on issue one and then you find that you're actually, you know, having drinks with so-and-so or going to birthday parties. And these, this is the stuff out of which actual political coalitions get made. So that's one thing. The second issue, which I'm sure Doug will talk about, is immigration. Um, immigration is another issue in which there's tremendous uh, overlap in the views of liberals and libertarians. And particularly, I think about a year and a half ago, when we saw the heat really turned up on the immigration debate, again, I found myself nodding at uh, nodding my head vigorously, even audibly saying things like, yes, yes, when reading things that Will Wilkinson would write, other things that were being published by Cato, um, that really were defending um, not just uh, a more just, humane uh, immigration regime, but also actually the dignity and humanity of immigrants themselves, which is something that was really missing in a lot of mainstream political discourse that was covering the immigration debate. And I think that that was an area in which there was tremendous uh, cohesion as well. And the third thing, which I'll spend a little more time on, and I think it's in some sense is the most interesting, is a critique of the economy of the last eight years. Um, there has been a variety of books uh, on the left written uh, that, that attempt to um, describe just what has been so awful about uh, the, the, the economic paradigm and political economy of the United States in the last eight years. And what they all, and this is, uh, Jamie Gilbreth has a great book called Predator State, uh, Naomi Klein Shock Doctrine, which I'm sure some people in the panel really don't like. Um, Tom Frank's Wrecking Crew, a variety of these books. And what's fascinating is they all come to essentially the same conclusion. And that conclusion is that, um, in the words of Dean Baker, who wrote a book that sort of 
didn't get as much attention, but he called it the conservative nanny state that the, the problem with the political economy of the United States in the last eight years has been a form of corporate socialism, crony capitalism, the worst instincts, the worst malfeasances of big government and big business married to each other. And on that, I think, in the uh, diagnosis of what's wrong, there is tremendous common ground with libertarians because the kind of economy that we've been running the last eight years has not, has not been uh, a free market economy in any real recognizable sense, and it also has not certainly been social democracy in any real recognizable sense. It's been this sort of hydra-headed monster of um, corruption and malfeasance. And it, you know, the, the perfect example of this is defense contracting or outsourcing of, of security um, issues. I once worked when I was trying to make a living as a young freelance writer for a public sector consulting firm. And I can tell you that when you privatize something uh, in government and you send it out to these consulting firms, the market in which that operates is, you know, Adam Smith's worst nightmare. I mean, this is not, you know, we are not all coming to the marketplace and, and, and bidding and creating an efficient outcome, but we are, our, you know, calling our friend who we used to work with when we were in the mayor's office and getting a sweetheart contract. Um, so this massive growth of both just as a percentage of GDP, the size of the government, but also the amount of what's going on inside that spending that is being doled out in a way that is offensive, I think, to every kind of core principle of both liberals and libertarians creates room for common ground. Which brings us to the financial crisis, which clearly has not been caused by, um, you know, contracting per se. But um, I I've been saying that in the wake of the financial crisis, the two sort of groups of people that end up looking the best are the Marxists and the Austrians, right? Because they both have very coherent um, descriptions of what, what went wrong. Um, and in fact, I've been sort of going back to von Mises and Hayek and, and reading them, and Minsky particularly, um, just because there is a really a, a somewhat prophetic sense of, of, of the, the pitfalls of sort of central banker capitalism. And then I've also been going back to Marx because he had some very smart things to say about um, financial crisis as well. So this is where we come to, I think, that even though there's a similarity in diagnosis about what's gone wrong in the last eight years, there's a real difference in prescription. And that's where I think the actual obvious battle sort of happens and where the, the, the difficulty of the coalition is brought out. And I think some of the things that Paul just talked about, which is our prescription, my prescription, those I think on the sort of liberal left prescription, is to say, look, this whole thing about the free market that we've been sort of invoking for so long was kind of always a hustle, really. And so let's sort of just ditch the pretense and then have a battle over exactly how we apportion that segment of the GDP that we're now doling out to contractors and, 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 and special interests so forth. And I think libertarians say, um, and I won't speak for them, but, but, but have also a very good critique about the fact that actually it is endemic to the, the very nature of this kind of growth of the state that it gets captured by special interests and uh, ends up in this sort of corrosive, uh, corrupted um, maelstrom that, we, that we've seen. Going forward, to me, um, that is the place where the, the wedge between the coalition seems almost a wide enough gulf that bridging it seems quite difficult. So I think that in the short term, as a sort of political, brute political matter, the coalitions are most strong around these specific issues um, in terms of getting things through Congress and, and legislation, and on this broader question about the nature of what kind of welfare state we're going to have going forward in the post-Bush years, you start to get at these um, much, much sort of uh, deeper disagreements. Well, that liberals and libertarians uh, share philosophical origins is clearly indicated uh, by their sharing of the common root word, liberalis, which means open or generous in the original Latin. Uh, both philosophies advocate civil liberties, uh, individual autonomy, uh, non-interventionist foreign policy, uh, limited state interference in private affairs, and in general, a reliance on markets rather than government to provide goods and services. Historically, uh, liberals differed from, uh, from libertarians in the degree to which they uh, uh, supported fiscal restraint and balanced budgets, and uh, a long-standing argument about the role of governments in creating and managing markets. 
Well, in terms of a lot of the core principles, civil liberties, we live in a, an age when the Bush administration has uh, set the law of the land such that the President of the United States can tomorrow declare me an enemy combatant and I can be taken to a brig and held for five years without uh, charges and without access to counsel or ju judicial review. That is the current state of the law that the Supreme Court has not seen to reverse. In terms of individual autonomy, uh, we have massive uh, uh, spying on individuals uh, in the United States, massive collection of information uh, with and without uh, judicial review. Uh, in terms of non-interventionist foreign policy, well, we've invaded Iraq and we've uh, put our money and, and our lives uh, into uh, what seems to be a black hole that uh, is not producing um, uh, desirable outcomes either in Iraq and certainly not for ourselves here and, and certainly hasn't won us any friends abroad. Uh, limited state interference in private affairs. The Bush administration is uh, kowtowed to the religious right and sought to regulate a variety of areas of private and family morality from childbearing to marriage to, to all kinds of things. Um, and uh, the reliance on markets rather than government to provide goods and services, well, uh, we just socialized uh, most of the financial sector. So um, why would any libertarian uh, want to remain in coalition with um, the current configuration of the Republican Party? It seems to me that the Republican Party is currently configured has abandoned virtually all of uh, its uh, traditional adherence to libertarian principles. Uh, and in terms of fiscal restraint and balanced budgets, uh, that used to be a, a point of contention, but I'll notice, uh, I'll simply note that it was President Clinton who uh, arranged uh, for balanced budgets and fiscal restraint, uh, and it was uh, Presidents uh, Reagan and Bush who uh, 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 engaged in uh, high uh, accelerated spending in the, in the same time that they, they engineered massive tax cuts to drive the United States government into massive uh, deficits, historically unprecedented deficits at this point. So uh, uh, in, in point of fact, uh, it seems like liberals and libertarians agree on, on, on a lot of things at this point and certainly would seem to agree more than, uh, than libertarians would agree with uh, the current configuration of the Republican Party. I think that the main area of potential disagreement is con concerns the role of government in creating and managing markets. Now liberals um, went through uh, uh, a kind of romance uh, with uh, command mechanisms and, and uh, full-blown socialism and even an attraction to communist, uh, communist ideology. But I think the record of the 20th century is fairly clear that when you, uh, to create a command economy, you have to concentrate such political power in a centralized state bureaucracy that inevitably a, a tyranny results and you end up with the, the gulags and, and, the, and uh, the tragedies of the Great Leap Forward and uh, what happened in Cambodia and so on. Uh, and so uh, liberals uh, have, uh, uh, with very good reason, um, um, come to accept the, uh, the uh, preference, uh, come to accept the uh, viability of markets, the importance of markets as uh, mechanisms for distributing goods and services. Um, <clears throat> so and they, they've shifted away from extremes, so a movement back uh, away from uh, 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 greater insistence on command mechanisms and uh, a willingness to consider uh, market mechanisms uh, to the extent that they're possible. Uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, on the other side, um, uh, uh, we've seen over the past uh, decade uh, uh, a countervailing ideology where government has no role and uh, government should just leave the field and somehow markets will spring into existence. Uh, but uh, it's become increasingly clear that markets are not a, a state of nature. Markets are a human invention, and uh, rather than being antithetical to markets, governments are essential for markets. Markets inevitably rest on an institutional foundation, uh, uh, and uh, there are many paths, uh, institutional paths, to creating a viable market society. And so rather than being talking about government intervention into markets, it's really how government uh, functions to uh, allow markets to perform uh, in the best interests of, uh, of, of people of a society. Uh, and uh, the evidence, I think, in the last two, two decades is fairly clear. In Latin America, uh, uh, 
free market economist, a neoliberal ideologist, uh, based on the Chilean experience, concluded, well, if the government just kind of gets out of the way, uh, markets will perform well. But Chile was a very unusual case. It had a stable middle class, well-defined property rights, a good court system, uh, uh, a, a lot of the essential institutional ingredients for an effective market, and so market mechanisms there, uh, uh, after an initial period of considerable contraction and pain, did begin to pay dividends. But the same policy of just doing nothing and having a state withdraw isn't going to work in a place like Bolivia or Peru, which have very weak societies, very weak states. And so the same medicine blindly applied in an ideological um, way around the world uh, leads to a rather chaotic and unex uh, uh, undesirable outcomes. And we see this from the Asian financial meltdown earlier uh, in the decade to um, of what happened in the, so in, the, in the former Soviet Union uh, to um, the, the various shifts going on in, in Latin America. And of course, uh, the last uh, 12 months have shown pretty um, conclusively to my mind that, um, uh, that uh, the trope of the free market uh, really uh, is misleading in the sense that uh, markets always require somebody to make decisions about rights and privileges, uh, obligations, contracts, institutions. All these things define how markets perform. And essentially what we've done over the past um, uh, ten, uh, eight, to ten, eight, eight years is uh, n not deregulate, but we've turned over regulation of the market to a very narrow sector of self-interested actors. And history shows repeatedly that when, when you allow this to happen, they inevitably destroy the, own, the market. They, uh, have such a, they, they inevitably skew the markets and the performance of markets to the extent that the whole system comes crashing down. That's precisely what we're witnessing now. So what this suggests to me is that on the one hand, uh, you know, full-blown command mechanisms, on the other hand, no government involvement, neither one of those pathways is viable. And what we need to do is talk, talk about how effective government uh, can be used to make markets work and in places where markets don't work, uh, how government can be used effectively to solve the market failures. Uh, that's an empirical question. It's not a philosophical question. We can agree philosophically that the desirable state of affairs is minimal government. Where you draw that line becomes an empirical question, and I think an empirical question where uh, a lot of in important and good discussion could happen. Jacob, could you lead off? The great economist Joseph Schumpeter, referring to the fortunes of the word liberal, once commented that, quote, as a supreme if unintended compliment, the enemies of the system of private enterprise have thought it wise to appropriate its label. <laughs> Many of my fellow libertarians, or classical liberals, as some of us insist on calling ourselves, share that view. It's always been my view that there, that's much more pithy than it is true, and that classical liberals and those who a century ago took the name of new liberals, but while broadly call a Gallus-Herian liberals, share much that is morally and philosophically important and true, and that we are ideological cousins sprung from common intellectual ancestry. We're also sprung from a shared cultural and class matrix. Liberals were neither the party of the peasantry and the working class, nor the peasantry of the soldier, the aristocrat, and the high clergy, but rather the party of the religious dissenter, the smallholder, the petty bourgeoisie, and the merchant. Now, the timing of our session is odd for an argument that I've been working on for some years now. I've been developing an account of why libertarians belong not in a great fusionist alliance with conservatives, but rather in common cause with our fellow liberals. It's an argument that depends in part on the relative importance of religious, cultural, conservative, social policy in the United States, as compared with fiscal policy that ostensibly divides libertarian and egalitarian liberals. Now, I think that's been an interestingly hard argument to make. But we meet at a time a few weeks before an election when I think the immediate conclusion to draw is boringly easy. No libertarian can hope to see the party of torture, the party of the denial of habeas corpus, indefinite detention without trial, and boundless, unsupervised executive power return to office. If our core liberalism 
If our roots in the struggles of common law against the absolutist king, or in Locke, or Montesquieu, or the American Revolution, mean anything at all to us, then it must mean that a four percentage point difference in marginal income tax rates is less important than removing the party of torture and, and detention without trial from power. That's morally so overwhelmingly important as to make my traditional arguments about libertarians leaving the fusionist alliance with the right seem kind of trivial. Conversely, I've had arguments as to why left liberals should welcome us into common cause and why they, as well as we, should be prepared to be changed or transformed by the alliance. I think that the US Democratic Party ought to build on the accomplishments of the Clinton years and extend and deepen the new democratic agenda. To a libertarian, those years of trade deals completed and successfully ratified, market liberalization spreading around the world, and moderate budget restraint at home for the first time in a generation, um, at a time that showed the progressive poverty-relieving potential of market-led growth, that must look like something like a paradise. But the paradise is lost. We are in for not only a recession and a financial contraction, but for an era of bad policy responses and reactions. I have no illusions that Democrats are going to come shopping for market-oriented or neoliberal or deregulatory reform ideas in the next couple of years. I think it's worth noting that Obama is from and of the market-friendly University of Chicago Law School, whereas the Republican Party not only nominated the moralizing, anti-market, anti-bourgeois, noblesse de paix John McCain, <laughs> but that it is likely to bring us four years from now a Palin-Huckabee contest that will confirm a Republican turn toward a singularly unattractive populism in which there is no room for libertarians at all. But this moment will pass, and anyway, I have little comparative advantage in talking about current events. Instead, I'd like to wave at political theory, one can't really talk about political theory in 10 minutes, but I will gesture toward some things, and about the divergence between classical and egalitarian liberals, and about what they can bring to each other today. During the era when the so-called new or social liberalism self-consciously departed from its market-oriented predecessor, the new liberals often maintained that their core liberal values needed to find new institutional and policy outcomes in the wake of the Industrial Revolution. That a corporation as much as a state could threaten a person's freedom. That the assembly line as much as censorship could stunt individual mental growth and development. In my view, unfortunately, they never did much more than establish the possibility of those analogies. They didn't do a lot of the interesting potential argumentative work on how old liberal premises and values, plus new industrial circumstances, could yield the new policy conclusions. Now, in part, this was because the major theorists of the turn, in Britain in particular, Thomas Green and Len Leonard Hobhouse, didn't really share the old liberal premises. Green had dunk, drunk too deeply at the well of Hegel, and Hobhouse was too quick to reject the moral priority of individuals. I think that a great deal of the political movement of the new liberalism was more continuous with the old. It drew from the same intellectual and cultural and class circles, for example. But the theoretical or philosophical turn to egalitarian liberalism got highly tied up with a generational intellectual shift to Hegelian idealism or to collectivism of various undesirable sorts. I think a similar story can be told in the United States around Woodrow Wilson and the mixing together of egalitarianism, progressivism, imperialism, and Jim Crow. In turn, I think that the classical liberals who lived through, say, the 1910s to the 1940s, saw the development of egalitarian liberalism as being of a piece with the intellectual and political crisis of those years. It was part of the same phenomenon to them as the flourishing of communism and fascism and the near collapse of liberal constitutionalism in the West. And thus, they made common cause with conservatives, who they took to be on the correct side of a great civilizational divide, no matter how many important things they were wrong about. And so the liberal center did not hold. Some liberals made common cause with social democrats who two generations before they had viewed as antagonists, and some with conservatives who two generations before they had viewed as antagonists. Fortunately, I think that Hegelianism, collectivism, and progressivism in that 20th century sense have been substantially unwound from the egalitarian cause. 
certainly in the United States since no later than Rawls and the Warren Court. An egalitarian liberalism that is committed to the priority of liberty, to the defense of civil liberties, to the social diversity characteristic of the post-1960s or 70s West, and to the anti-authoritarianism of the new left. That's a liberalism worthy of the name. And libertarians in my generation, while we may have learned from people who learned from people who were shaped by the long crisis of the 20th century, we inhabit a different world from the one in which the fusion with the right seemed to make sense. Today, the national greatness conservatism of Crystal and McCain that says let us have a war or crisis just so that we may have organic national unity that will morally elevate us and bring us out of our degraded private market-oriented lives. That's the kind of thing that a century ago characterized progressivism and the new liberalism at their worst. But it is, I think, almost entirely absent from the egalitarian liberalism of today. I want to close with a few thoughts about what egalitarian and classical liberals can learn from each other now and what our common causes might be. From the classical liberal, the egalitarian liberal has learned one huge lesson and ought to learn a few more. The huge lesson is, of course, the productive and progressive power of markets. While I think economic discourse is going to turn sour for a little while, we are not going to return to the 1970s, still less to the 1940s or 1930s. Egalitarian liberals may overestimate the number of tiny cuts that the golden goose can survive, but they will no longer elevate to the level of moral aspiration if slaughter. They're not going to complain about how awful it is that economic activity is uncoordinated and based on selfishness. The lessons that they ought to learn, I think, are at least these three. First, that the choice is never between an existing market and an ideal regulation or intervention. It has to be made between a, pl a politically plausible market and a politically plausible or predicted regulation or intervention. Second, the egalitarian should remember that egalitarianism's moral force ought to be global and therefore that the egalitarian has more reason than others, not less, to favor openness to immigration and to trade. Free trade is, along with religious freedom and the rule of law, one of liberalism's, all liberalism's founding commitments. And I think we libertarians can help call our egalitarian friends back to their best selves by reminding them of that. And third, remember that the, the exercise of coercive power tends not to be done in the interest or for the benefit of the powerless. And often limiting state power is the most progressive policy option on the table. The American war on drugs and the resultant criminalization of vast portions of America's poor is perhaps the most dramatic of examples. From the egalitarian liberal, I fear that the classical liberal has not yet learned any of the necessary big lessons. Let me focus on two. The first is that where distributive effects from deliberately enacted policies are inevitable, and in modern politics they often are, it is better that those effects be progressive rather than regressive. At any given level of spending, we have moral reason to prefer the spending alleviate poverty and suffering rather than that it be wasted or that it bolster those who are already powerful. The view of the big government right has been that spending on the rich somehow didn't count as spending, and that state corporatism could still claim the mantle of the marketplace. The Bush administration's drug benefit is a spectacular example. Huge government spending, but so long as it's arranged to subsidize a corporate sector rather than to alleviate poverty, it doesn't really count. Classical liberals need to be able and willing to say that there's a principled reason to prefer progressivity to regressivity and corporatism alongside our principled reasons to prefer smaller government over larger. We will not always be able to have a government that is simultaneously smaller and more progressive, but we will sometimes. And as we have for the last eight years, we will sometimes be able to have a government that is neither, which suggests the possibility of Pareto improvements from the joint perspective of egalitarian and libertarian liberals. For the second lesson, I want to focus on the fact that Friedrich Hayek considered the rule of law 
to be such an attractive and foundationally liberal concept that he attempted to subsume most of his political theory under its label. I think he was right about some of that, though not all of it. But the analogical extension of the rule of law to cover questions of economic policy and economic liberty depends on the conceptual core of the rule of law being stable and intact, the separation of powers, constraint on executive authority, due process, and all the rest that Hayek wrote such a marvelous history of in the middle chapters of Constitution of Liberty. This allows me to draw my broad theoretical point back to the contemporary political point with which I began. The rule of law, the subjection of executive power to law, and the protections of due process of law. These are accomplishments that is so easy to take for granted that we can focus on other things. But they are always fragile. And their defense and their vindication is a fundamental common cause of liberals of whatever stripe. Let me start with a bit of autobiography. Uh, I came here to Princeton as a freshman uh, in the fall of 1980. I had just turned 18. And uh, at equivalent ages, if not at the same time, Chris and I were about as far apart as we could be on that little political quiz. Uh, I was a hot-headed, fire-breathing libertarian. I considered myself such a head full of Ayn Rand and Milton Friedman. Uh, and as a matter of political philosophy, I thought that both liberalism and conservatism were completely out of whack. Uh, so, at a philosophical level, I was none of the above. But then that November, uh, in the first opportunity I had to vote, I voted enthusiastically for Ronald Reagan, uh, conservative Republican. So as a matter of practical politics, if not philosophy, I was, uh, for lack of a better term, a conservative sympathizer, a consimp. <laughs> uh, so that in the, the, in the actual political arena, conservatives and conservative Republicans in particular were the only people I saw that cared about the things I most cared about, the ideals of limited government and free markets. And while I found the religious rights uh, social agenda uh, noxious, um, nonetheless it seemed to me that conservatism mostly uh, paid that lip service and so it wasn't too hard for me uh, to, to be enthusiastic about the rise of uh, conservatism to power. My enthusiasm waned uh, considerably from that fall of 1980 onward, uh, but I stuck with it. And so for election cycle after election cycle, when I could manage to bring myself to vote, I always voted for Republicans. But then uh, flash forward a few years and go to 2006, and this registered Republican voted straight Democrat uh, in the uh, congressional elections. Uh, I didn't like any of the candidates I voted for, but it seems to me uh, that Republican rule of Congress just had to be ended and that some constraints on the power of the Bush administration just had to be raised. Uh, now, in a couple of weeks, I'm uh, planning on voting for Barack Obama, despite the fact that I have uh, profound disagreements with him about a whole bunch of things. Uh, and just yesterday, I finally got around to doing something that I've been meaning to do for a while, I uh, changed my voter registration from Republican uh, to unaffiliated. I just don't want to belong to that club anymore. So what's happened to me uh, has been happening to a lot of people like me, uh, people who, if not self-consciously libertarian, nonetheless lean uh, in a libertarian direction. And if you, uh, major polling uh, firms will try to divide the political spectrum, not just into left, right, but as, uh, as Chris said, into uh, uh, li liberal, conservative, libertarian, and populist authoritarian, uh, so that the economically conservative, socially liberal quadrant is the libertarian quadrant, the socially conservative, uh, economically liberal quadrant is the populist quadrant. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> these, uh, the way to define these quadrants is not terribly satisfactory, but uh, the various attempts tend to find about 15% of the electorate falling in this libertarian-leaning group. Uh, and this libertarian-leaning group, uh, since at least the 1970s, was a solidly Republican constituency voting. Uh, it varied from election to election, but usually in the 70s uh, for Republican presidential and congressional candidates. 
In the past couple of election cycles, however, 2004, 2006, uh, that Republican support had gone down to the mid-50s. So uh, this libertarian-leaning constituency certainly has not become loyal Democrats, uh, but they are no longer dependable Republicans. Uh, what's going on? As Chris said, we're in a time of real ideological flux. Political identities and partisan loyalties are up for grabs in a way that they really haven't been for some decades. In particular, the old fusionist alliance uh, between economic libertarians and social conservatives, the alliance that really is the foundation uh, for the post-war uh, conservative movement, is coming unglued. And whether it will be reassembled in some form remains to be seen. But some of us aren't waiting around to find out. Some of us have decided uh, to return to our liberal roots. Classical liberals is one of the t terms we call ourselves, even if nobody else understands what we're talking about. Uh, we've decided uh, to seek our fortunes on the center left and try to make a home there. Uh, now, it's not an especially inviting place in the, uh, for a lot of reasons that have already been mentioned and we'll talk about further uh, later on. Uh, but uh, if the choice is between identifying with and engaging with people who share our most basic political values, but with whom we disagree about how to achieve those values, versus identifying with and engaging with and cooperating with uh, people who, with whom we may agree on some means, uh, but uh, about which we disagree profoundly about ends, uh, then it seems to me much more comfortable uh, to base one's political identity uh, on basic values. Uh, bottom line, uh, I'd much rather hang out with liberals and argue about economics than hang out with conservatives and argue about Darwin and stem cells and whether Barack Obama is really an American. Uh, as Jacob alluded to, uh, this isn't a, really a propitious time for libertarians to make their mark on American liberalism. Uh, Democrats are doing quite well electorally without making uh, any noticeable effort to appeal to people like me. Uh, and I imagine that will go on for a while. <clears throat> Meanwhile, uh, the gaseous emanations of the commentariat in recent weeks would have you believe that the era of free markets is over and uh, that uh, free markets have been completely discredited by the recent financial turmoil. And that will take a while to settle down. So liberals may think that they don't want us or need us, uh, but it really doesn't matter because uh, we're coming anyway. Uh, <laughs> you already see this. You see a drift of people who were previously core uh, uh, Republican constituencies now becoming core Democratic constituencies. Uh, Republicans used to be the party of finance and big business. Uh, Wall Street, what's left of it, is, uh, is you know, a major source of money for the Democratic Party. What is big business today but the information technology sector? And Dem Silicon Valley is a Democratic bastion. So people uh, who are socially liberal yet tuned into markets and allergic to the kind of economic populist message that, uh, that frequently comes out of the Democratic Party uh, are already in the Democratic Party. They're already making their influence felt. Uh, and if the conservative drift towards cultural populism uh, continues, then more of us refugees will wash up on liberal shores, uh, whether you want us to or not. And once we're here, we'll start uh, making our influence uh, felt, or we'll try. <clears throat> uh, and uh, let me just say, uh, before talking about disagreements, uh, that, that I think uh, the disagreements are real and they're important, uh, but they should be put in context. And, and I think that when it comes down to deciding who is in liberalism's big tent, it is issues of basic values and issues uh, of fundamental importance that ought to decide what the boundaries of that tent are. Issues of torture and civil liberties, unchecked uh, executive power, issues of war and peace. When we're looking at the social problems that afflict America today, we have 12 million undocumented workers uh, in this country. What are we going to do about that? Uh, what are we going to do about the, the, <clears throat> the uh, poorly designed laws that create this kind of problem? Uh, what could be a greater scandal and a greater blight uh, 
uh, than the failed war on drugs. Now, what could be uh, a greater, if almost entirely uh, unknown, stain on America than the fact that now over 1% of adults are behind bars? Uh, these are really important issues by comparison to which a political debate that regards a 35% top tax rate as social Darwinism and a 39.5% top tax rate as socialism is just brain dead. Uh, on health care, we're going to end up with some kludgy mix of private and public provision, and we need to figure out the best way to do that uh, in the face of uh, some very difficult uh, constraints. And uh, again, I don't think that uh, despite our disagreements, is a profound philosophical disagreement that puts me on one side of the abyss and liberals on the other. Likewise, what to do about public pensions in a system uh, that was designed as a pay-as-you-go system when you had uh, a rapidly growing population uh, and a small retired population to now one that's the converse, uh, where it's rapidly aging and the uh, ratio of active workers to retirees is getting ever less favorable. That's a problem. Uh, even if the system can be maintained, it doesn't work as well as it used to. Uh, and uh, so the idea that the final word in social policy design was had in the 1930s seems to me uh, worthy of talking about uh, and spirited discussion and empirical inquiry rather than ideological commitment. But let me back up on all of that. I've got my opinions. Libertarians have their opinions about the welfare state. Uh, but uh, I think the sort of newer breed of libertarians uh, doesn't consider that to be of fundamental bedrock importance. I think that Sweden and Denmark are two of the most blessed and well-governed countries in the world. They're fantastic places to live, uh, and they get most things right. Uh, so uh, I think fundamentally, if you have dynamic markets, you can afford a big welfare state. Maybe you can be smarter and have a smaller one that works just as well, but you can afford one. So to me, that doesn't seem uh, like an issue of fundamental importance. Once upon a time, when liberals still seem to be enamored of an ultimate sort of social democratic endgame uh, or a socialist endgame, and so libertarians interpreted every expansion of the government as a slippery slope towards totalitarianism. These things took on a huge importance that now just doesn't seem to me uh, to be there anymore. Uh, let me conclude with just talking about our, what I think is our biggest single disagreement, and that is on the size and scope of the welfare state. Now, there is a radical utopian species of libertarianism that rejects the welfare state in toto. Uh, according to this view, the only legitimate function of government is to protect individual uh, rights to life and property, and therefore any taxing of Peter to subsidize Paul is out of bounds. Well, let me say, uh, I'm not that kind of libertarian. I don't think Will is that kind of libertarian. And I don't think Jacob is either. In fact, uh, two of the greatest, uh, the two greatest, libertarian intellectuals of the 20th century, F.A. Hayek and Milton Friedman, weren't that kind of libertarian either. Uh, both supported the state provision of some kind of minimum uh, income. Uh, in fact, it was Milton Friedman's idea of a negative income tax that really is the root of one of the more successful and popular social programs of recent years, the earned income tax credit. So it's just no good to dismiss libertarians out of bounds as sort of a radical fringe that is seeking to destroy uh, the welfare state. That's, that's just not confronting our strongest arguments. Uh, so if the debate over the welfare state isn't simply a binary choice, yes or no, uh, <clears throat> where is the line to be drawn and what really is the difference between a libertarian approach and the liberal approach? Uh, my best shot at sketching that line in a sentence uh, would be that the question is whether we will have government and social services that supplement the workings of markets and civil society, or instead we will have social services that seek to supplant uh, private markets and civil society. In the former vision, I see that the government's role is supplemental. It's exceptional. Uh, it steps in, uh, presuming that generally people can take care of themselves, but under particular specified conditions, uh, they can't do for themselves what government can do for them, uh, and therefore acts 
literally, in the form of social insurance. But it takes the term social insurance seriously. Uh, that is, insurance is a payoff in the case of a risky contingency that not everybody suffers, but once in a while you hit uh, that and, uh, and the insurance pays out. That's the libertarian vision of, of the welfare state, a safety net, a backstop, uh, one that will rely uh, much more on means-tested uh, programs than on universal uh, uh, entitlements, uh, one that will uh, seek to uh, direct money directly to individuals rather than to uh, create service-providing uh, bureaucracies. Um, and I would argue that the case uh, for uh, this kind of approach in general, and of course there's all kinds of empirical questions about how it will work and how you would get there from here, but there's two solid liberal grounds, not uh, radical libertarian grounds, uh, for this basic kind of approach. Uh, first, the liberal presumption of liberty. Uh, the idea is that uh, in a presumptive libertarianism, not an absolutist libertarianism, but in a presumptive libertarianism, uh, <clears throat> people should be left to do their own thing unless there's a good reason to deviate from that. And so if ordinary people can provide for their own retirement, ordinary people can purchase health insurance under ordinary circumstances, then that ought to be allowed. If there are exceptional circumstances in which people can't take care of themselves, can't uh, uh, or fall into uh, temporary problems, uh, or are disabled, uh, the government steps in under these exceptional circumstances. It supplements the income of people who are unable to earn a de decent living. It provides for the disabled. It subsidizes health care for the poor and chronically ill. It provides temporary assistance for the jobless uh, or for the otherwise economically dislocated. Uh, but it doesn't attempt to sweep all people, whether they need it or not, into universalist cradle-to-grave dependency on beneficent government. The, uh, the second principle, or sound liberal reason, I think, uh, for supporting uh, a more safety net oriented form of uh, welfare state is that government policy, government social policy, ought to be progressive. It ought to prioritize uh, helping the disadvantaged and needy rather than padding the pockets of the comfortable uh, through government means. And uh, of course you could argue, let's have both, right? Let's have a nice, big, fat, universal, middle-class entitlement system, plus we'll take care of the needy. But it doesn't work that way, because there are trade-offs and there are constraints. And the fact is that if you uh, use up a lot of the uh, public tolerance for taxing and spending on programs that slosh great gobs of money from one cohort of the middle class to another, uh, then you have uh, really priced yourself out of doing more for a really contingent social insurance welfare state. And we see that today. We see that 40% the, that of our federal budget goes to people over 65. Uh, this is not a class of people that is, uh, that is especially needy uh, in the scheme of things. Uh, and so uh, I think that if you do care seriously about uh, some of these uh, deep, uh, profound social ills that are in our country, the issues of mass incarceration, the issues of illegal immigration, the issues of intergenerational poverty. You would want to see resources freed up to deal with those, to provide a, tr a generous uh, contingent welfare state uh, in a way that we're never going to get to as long as uh, much of what is defined as the welfare state is just uh, shuffling money back and forth within the middle class. And with that, I'll close. Thank you. Good afternoon. I hope you're not uh, all uh, tiring out. Uh, I have no energy to listen to me. I'm going to try to make a painless uh, for you and, uh, and, uh, and as uh, swift as I can. Uh, I, I'm, I think I'm talking today partly because I'm lonely. Um, I, 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 I don't know where I uh, belong. Uh, 
my politics are the politics of Milton Friedman and Friedrich Hayek. Uh, I mean, very, very literally. Like, if you read Hayek's Law, Legislation, and Liberty, or Capitalism and Freedom by Milton Friedman, it, it, that's my politics. Uh, and so uh, my friends on the left will tell me that I'm a crazed market fundamentalist. Uh, when I describe uh, to my libertarian friends uh, you know, a couple facts that uh, Brink just mentioned that uh, Friedrich Hayek uh, was in defense, uh, argued in defense of a guaranteed minimum income, that uh, Milton Friedman in fact designed uh, a minimum income system, uh, they told me that I'm not a libertarian at all, uh, that, I'm, that I'm just a squish. Uh, and so I'm like, I, what is it? Uh, if I, I, I just believe whatever Milton Friedman and Hayek believe, and if they're crazy market fundamentalists, then I guess I, that I, I guess I'm one of those too. But but if they're not actually even libertarians because of the actual content of their beliefs, then I don't. Then I then maybe I'm not a libertarian <laughs> either. So I, so I, I end up feeling very lonely. Um, but what I want to ask today is is why it is that. Uh, conventional egalitarian liberals, uh, people who uh, come out of the tradition of John Rawls and, uh, and similar strands of 20th century social thought, find the view that's in Hayek or Friedman uh, unsatisfactory. Uh, I, I've been sort of searching out what those sticking points are. Um, and I'm going to try to diagnose one of them and then try to describe why I don't think it ought to keep us from being friends. Um, the idea that I find in uh, Hayek and Friedman is that what we want is a system of institutions that unleashes human creativity, creativity and maximizes prosperity, that maximizes economic growth, that leaves people, on average, as well off as they might be. They all they rec recognize um, and think very hard about the fundamental fact that not everybody has an equal opportunity to participate fully in the system of market cooperation and so uh, don't have the opportunity to benefit fully from it for no fault of their own. Uh, and if the idea of a good society is one of cooperation to mutual advantage. It needs to have a certain kind of reciprocity built into it. And one way of doing that is indemnifying people against the risk of just bad luck or failure. Uh, you put a floor on the downside of a high growth market economy. And that's it. Why isn't that good enough? Why can't we just maximize economic growth and put a floor under how far people can fall. Uh, interestingly, there are experiments uh, that uh, Joe Oppenheimer, and I'm forgetting the other person's name, uh, try to replicate the conditions of John Rawls's uh, famous uh, veil of ignorance thought experiment. And the idea is that you don't know who you are, you don't know your place in society, and you're picking the distributive principle that you would want in that state of uncertainty. Uh, and Rawls says you're going to pick a principle that maximizes the welfare of the people at, at the bottom of the income distribution. But if you actually put people in uh, experimental circumstances where you basically ask them the question, that's not what they say. They say maximize the average and create a floor. Right? Uh, that's kind of what I thought uh, Friedman and Hayek were saying, and that's what I want. Um, so what's the problem with this? Well, in my experience, the main catch, uh, keeping with my sort of bit of a Hayek theme, is what I'm, I'm going to call the, the inequality road to serfdom. Right. And uh, of course, you know that the, uh, Hayek wrote a book called The Road to Serfdom, which argued that if we sort of start with a little bit of uh, a, a managed economy, sooner or later we're going to end up in sort of full-fledged uh, socialist economic planning. The inequality road to serfdom ha has, it plays a similar role in the thinking of a lot of 
uh, egalitarian liberals. Uh, the core thought is summed up well by uh, Justice Brandeis, who once said, quote, we can have a democratic society or we can have great concentrated wealth in the hands of a few. We cannot have both. Um, John Rawls himself emphasizes that unchecked economic inequalities will lead to political inequalities and status inequalities. And this can directly threaten the liberties of the least well-off, uh, or it can threaten the liberties of the least well-off both directly and indirectly. Um, directly by denying them the conditions for equal democratic representation, and indirectly um, by the demoralizing effects of low relative social position which leads to a sense of resignation and political disengagement. Um, uh, Princeton's own uh, sort of freshly laureled Nobel Prize winner, uh, Paul Krugman, has been making the inequality road to serfdom argument with, with uh, vehement force uh, in his recent writings. Um, so let me quote some Krugman to give you a taste. Uh, the United States doesn't have third world levels of economic inequality yet. But it's not hard to foresee in the current state of our political and economic scene the outline of a transformation into a permanently unequal society, one that locks in and perpetuates the drastic economic polarization that is already dangerously far advanced. Uh, according to Krugman, we have failed to grasp that we are in such a dangerous position because of, quote, the growing influence of our emerging plutocracy, unquote, which he actually says includes people who work for the Cato Institute, so you might want to take what I say with a grain of salt. Um, Krugman goes on to say, even if the form of democracy remain, the forms remain, they may become meaningless. It's all too easy to see how we may become a country in which the big rewards are reserved for people with the right connections, in which ordinary people see little hope of advancement, in which political involvement seems pointless because in the end, the interests of the elite always get served. And I think uh, Yale political scientist Robert Dahl puts the argument uh, in, a, in a way that especially highlights why my Hayekian growth maximizing social insurance state uh, won't do. Dahl says, because market capitalism inevitably creates inequalities, it limits the democratic potential of um, his favorite kind of democracy by generating inequalities in the distribution of political resources. Because of inequalities in political resources, some citizens gain significantly more influence than others over the government's policies, decisions, and actions. So if the inequality road to serfdom narrative is correct, then the growth maximizing social insurance state of Friedman or Hayek can't be a picture of a genuinely liberal society since it fails to recognize clearly enough the role of democracy in securing the rights of all, especially the least well-off, and fails to see the role of relative economic equality in preserving the ability of democracy to serve this function. So I want to offer the idea that almost all the key elements of the inequality road to serfdom are false, and I offer this conjecturally for discussion, so maybe we can work out one of our main sticking points uh, that's keeping us from being friends, because I'm lonely. Um, so first of all, um, Krugman in particular, and I think he's been saying, uh, <coughs> make, telling this story with the most persuasive force recently, uh, he says a number of things that have a rhetorical plausibility that depend on uh, getting uh, the direction of causation backwards. Um, it is, in fact, true that, uh, that, that there are, is a high correlation internationally between income inequality and the rule of entrenched predatory political elites. Um, but the reason for that is that uh, political predation is the world's leading cause of inequality. Uh, and in that case, the Gini coefficient is just a side effect of a, a more fundamental criminal injustice. Uh, the, the relevant argument uh, is that even inequalities created by fair procedures of consensual economic cons exchange, even inequalities that are generated by fair market processes <laughs> threaten democracy and therefore equal liberty. All right, I, I think it's really important to note that the inequality road to serfdom argument, it's not just a conceptual or philosophical argument, it's actually based in a number of empirical conjectures, some falsifiable 
empirical claims. It makes some predictions. Uh, one of those predictions is that past a certain threshold level of economic inequality, the democratic process will in fact tend to lock in and even exacerbate trends in inequality by successfully resisting redistributive policy. Uh, now, Krugman, uh, to take that example, seems to really believe that we are near or past that threshold. And so the way that this is supposed to work uh, in the American context is that the success of the party that, most, that is most strongly supported by the poor and which favors greater redistribution will, will in fact be systematically undermined as inequality gets out of control. Um, but that's not what we're seeing. Uh, what have we seen during the recent run-up in income inequality over the past decade or so? What we've seen is a significant movement of wealthy voters toward the Democratic Party. Um, that seems to be inconsistent with the story. Uh, for example, a, a, an April 2007 Pew Research survey found, quote, Democrats, po Democrats polling even with Republicans among registered voters with annual incomes, family incomes of over $130,000. Um, in the current election, Barack Obama is completely destroying John McCain in terms of fundraising. Um, now, that might just be uh, a well of discontent with the uh, incumbent party, uh, but it remains that among super wealthy voters, people who have net, uh, who have, uh, net holdings of over $30 million favor Obama, who's been frankly and uh, admirably clear about his intention to raise taxes and to uh, increase uh, the, uh, uh, the generosity of welfare programs. They favor him at about 66% over McCain. Um, when you ask the super rich voters what's important to them, uh, tax policy is at the very bottom of their list. Uh, their first concern is social issues. As uh, Columbia political scientist Andrew Gelman points out in his uh, fascinating book, uh, Rich State, Poor State, Red State, Blue State, uh, the relatively strong preference for democratic candidates among the poor has remained very stable over the years. The big development over the last several decades, uh, which uh, is the same time period during which income inequality has been rising and rising, the big issue is an increased partisan divide between rich voters. Uh, drawing on the work of uh, Ronald Engelhardt, Gelman conjectures that as people get richer, uh, the less their political preferences will track their conception of their narrow economic self-interest. Uh, the division among the wealthy breaks down like this. Uh, basically, if you're rich and you go to church, you're socially conservative. If you're rich and you don't go to church, you're socially liberal. Uh, and as the U.S. gets richer, as economic growth proceeds apace, it's also getting more secular. Um, so the actual events and trends seem to suggest that rising inequality is not inconsistent with increasing support among the rich for more egalitarian and redistributivist parties and policies. And that seems to me to just straightforwardly falsify the key prediction of the inequality road to serfdom story. Um, one thing you might say is that, well, uh, we haven't passed the threshold of inequality. We still, you know, we still haven't reached that critical point. And thinkers like Paul Krugman are so good at what they do and so persuasive that they move public opinion. Uh, and I think there's actually a lot to be said in favor of that view. Um, but that view is, I think, also in a lot of tension with the idea that economic inequalities translate very cleanly into inequalities in political power or inequalities in political resources. If what you think of as a political resource is the capacity to affect the outcome of a democratic process. I think if you were able to plot the distribution of political resources uh, in the way that you can plot a distribution of income, you would find that it is incredibly highly unequal. Um, I don't think there's any doubt about that. But I also think you'd find that political resources cluster very heavily among elite academics and the media, who also tend to be a, a left-leaning constituency who argue consistently and uh, vociferously, like Paul Krugman, in favor of redistributive policy. So it's not even clear that inequalities in political resources caches out in a system that neglects 
the welfare of the least well-off. Uh, as far as we know and as far as we can see, uh, it might even support the welfare of the least well-off. Uh, last, the, the, I think one of the big questions is that part of liberal equality and part of democratic equality is that everybody has an equal say in the democratic process. And that if you have a stratum of voters who don't vote as much or whose ver voice isn't as strong in the political process, uh, then they will be uh, disenfranchised. Um, and I think that's a, a, an important and worrying concern. But there's something paradoxical about this line of thinking that, 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 that I want to draw out to end. Uh, I think the ideal of full de democratic participation really is an ideal. Um, and what you need in order to get highly motivated, well-informed voters is everybody needs to get up to a certain threshold of income. Everybody needs to get up to a certain threshold of education. In order to get that, the democracy needs to actually implement policies that are effective at producing that result. Right? The question is what policies are actually effective at producing that result. Uh, it might not be the case that a system in which the poorest and least educated people uh, are extremely politically active is the system in which the democracy produces the best policies. Right? So uh, that is what I'm, what I'm calling the Zen riddle of democracy, that, that in a non-ideal democracy, full participation can actually retard progress toward the ideal of full participation by making it more difficult to implement the policies that actually bring people at the bottom up to that threshold where they can really effectively participate. Thanks. Well, you heard the uh, interventions from uh, Team Liberal and Team uh, Libertarian. Now to make sense of it all, and with reactions, we'll start with uh, John Tomasi and then move to Paul DiMaggio. Um, I'm in a weak position as a commentator uh, for two reasons. The first reason kind of boring and the other reason more significant, I think. I'm in a weak position first um, because the way this panel's been organized, um, the commentators just listen and then respond off the cuff rather than seeing the stuff in advance. So that's sort of the boring sense in which I'm in a weak position. I'm in a weaker position, though, I'm in a weaker position for another reason that's more important, and that's that I agree with almost everything that everyone said from both sides. You know, it's, it's best to be a commentator when you find yourself in a target-rich environment, you just get out and you blaze away. But I agree with almost everything that everyone said. There was one note, I have to say, though, that I did not agree with. The note was not central to the conversation, it seemed to me, but I, had to, I wouldn't be honest if I didn't tell you I didn't find it disturbing. Um, the comments that were made about religious conservatives uh, seemed to me to be, to be unargued for, almost, the, almost as though they were made with the assumption that there would be no religious conservatives to take the issues up. I actually personally found those uh, divisions between the panelists and some group that we'll call con religious conservatives um, unfortunate. Um, I regret that that happened, but maybe we'll t discuss it as we go. But I'm not here to kill the buzz. Actually, what I want to do is um, get the party going more. So I, I'm going to put aside the issue with religious conservatives. We can talk about Sailor Palin and our soul, if you like. I think our soul is saleable, but saveable. We can talk about that. But what I want to do is. Uh, invite my co-panelists, I think they've been sort of sipping champagne together and enjoying themselves. I want to encourage them to um, drink the whole bottle and really come together. What I'm going to suggest is that if there are, there are three moves that I'm going to suggest that they make, if they make the three moves, they'll really be one. Now what I'm going to do it is actually not just moves, but three cups. So I'm going to pour three cups and encourage them, if they're willing and daring, to drink the, each of these cups down. If they drink them all down, they're not just going to be friendly with each other. They're going to be, I won't say it, embedded. They're going to be, they're going to be really together. So here are the three cups that I encourage them to consider. First cup. I think they should consider uh, accepting, pondering and accepting a distinction between libertarianism and classical liberalism. This is the easiest cup to drink. Libertarians, I guess, are people who affirm absolute rights to um, economic freedoms. So uh, that was a Paul, uh, one of Paul's formulations. E economic liberties have absolute priority over other civil and political liberties. 
It's a view. I suppose, high, I suppose Nozick may have held it, perhaps. Rothbard, I think, held it. Rand maybe held it. Not many people hold that view. The other view, though, not libertarianism, but something like classical liberalism, uh, is a view that says that economic freedoms are weighty, but they should not be absolute. Rather, they should be considered as included as part of a fully adequate scheme of basic rights and liberties. That is, economic liberties can't just be given left to the legislative decision-making level. Economic liberties should be constitutionally entrenched. They should be strictly limiting. They should heavily limit legislative powers. They should be treated along with people's civil and political liberties as among the basic liberties. That approach, the classical liberal approach, allows room for taxation for social service programs such as education and uh, social safety nets. It also allows uh, taxation of the kinds of regulations to provide public goods, including fluid credit markets. That's, that's the tradition of, of Locke, of Smith, of Madison, of Hayek, and others. So that's the first cup. Separate libertarianism from classical liberalism, and if you drink it down, be a classical liberal, run our way. Second cup, sorry, I'm gonna, I'm just hacky, but I've had a PowerPoint, I wouldn't do this, but I'm just gonna. Second cup, people on the panel were saying nice things, especially the libertarians, who I usually hang around with most. They were saying things like, we have to think about how to best serve the disadvantaged, or we have to think about people's dignity and their opportunities. That's good, but the cup that I invite them to drink down is, accept social justice as a basic standard of society. And indeed, accept the idea full, full heartedly and just drink it down that, um, that Rawls on a level of identification was roughly right. Justice is fairness, never, you, have to, you have to prune away the ideological institutional stuff from Rawls, but just on the, on the question of what justice is, something like justice is fairness is an attractive moral ideal. The function of a liberal society is to create the conditions in which all people can exercise the powers they have as free and equal citizens. Hayek, I think, is a great resource for that cup drinkage. Hayek wrote a book, as you all know, called The Road to um, uh, the Mirage of Social Justice, Volume 2 of Law, Legislation, and Liberty. In the introduction to that book, he notes that, he, that, he, that Rawls' book had just come out and he actually accepts the basic same ideas Rawls does. He says, the differences between himself and Rawls are basically verbal. Hayek, in important ways that we can talk about if you want, affirm social justice. I think that my colleagues should drink the cup right down. Smith didn't know about social justice. Hayek was in this difficult position of not wanting to accept socialism. But we're past that now, so I encourage libertarians to chug the social justice cup, um, join that party. And then finally, and closest to my heart, um, modern liberals, uh, egalitarian liberals, the social democrats, some of them were saying it. They were, they were, they were saying it. The panelists thought I kind of wondered, but they were saying it enough to make me think they might actually drink the third cup too. The th third cup is to say, look, if classical liberals aren't libertarians, and if classical liberals affirm social justice, then the policy debates between, between the left and the right, on this panel at least, are really genuinely only policy debates. They're debates about empirical matters. They're complicated. There are enormously complex issues at, 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 at stake. It's not reasonable people of good faith can disagree about whether we should aim for more government, more, more direct governmental programs, or more market-based programs. There are concentrations of, of, of private power, as the people on the left and the panel are emphasizing. They need to recognize also that there can be concentrations of political power that can be just as damaging to people's freedoms, providing guarantees of people's liberties, of civil liberties, such as socialism provided guarantees, they didn't do very well. Means-tested welfare provided guarantees, that didn't do very well either. Providing direct guarantees is not always the most appropriate strategy. The basic question, if you drink number cup, cup number three, is you recognize you're all together now, and the real question is what form of social construction, a more one based more on democratic processes and direct attempts at control, or one based more on market-based processes, will be most likely to bring us to justice. So. The end. To libertarians, I say, become classical liberals. To classical liberals, I say, become Rawlsians, accept Rawlsian justice. To the modern liberals, I say, recognize that in fact, if you want to bring the left, the, the right to you, you have to bring yourself to the right too. It can't be all on your terms. It should be a genuinely open conversation about what works best for America. Thanks.
So I'm sort of a latecomer to the, the schedule, and I wasn't sure why I was invited, because I'm not a political philosopher, and I haven't written a book about liberalism. And I thought maybe I was invited in some karmic way, because the first election that I was sort of sentient for was 1964. And I actually was a Goldwater supporter. Like a lot of people my age, which was 13 at the time, I was uh, <laughs> impressed by Conscience of a Conservative. I was reading Ayn Rand, um, even read the National Review occasionally. And I, I left, jumped ship when um, Goldwater voted against the Civil Rights Act of 64, which I thought was a very strange position for a libertarian. Um, but I continue to have sort of a warm spot in my heart from him. I think he redeemed himself later in life. So it's actually great to see liberals and libertarians here together agreeing on almost everything. Um, so I'm going to try to just make a few comments and see if I can, you know, sow some division. Um, the, um, so there are a lot of things where I think there are common ground. Immigration, war have been mentioned. I teach telecommunications and internet policy, and that's an area where there's, I think, a lot in common. I always use stuff from the Cato Institute on intellectual property whenever I teach it. Um, but I think there, there are other things where there may be, or, or maybe not, some, some tension. One is that there's tension between what rights liberals and libertarians traditionally have seen as most important. And I think uh, Paul talked about that, and, um, and Doug did as well. And I'm going to say a bit more about it in a second. Uh, the second potential area of division is at the presuppositional level. Um, how libertarians and liberals imagine what the economy is and, and what the person is. Um, at the level of the economy, I think libertarians traditionally have believed that markets are potentially free and usually competitive, and so that competition works. Whereas I think that uh, liberals have ordinarily believed that private property is constitutionally and juridically created, it's socially constructed, so that em economic rights are embedded in an institutional system. Um, listening, though, to, to Jacob and to um, and to Brink, I'm not sure that that division is what it once was. And it may just be that, you know, you all invited sort of ringers to come here to represent the, <laughs> the libertarian group. But um, the second presuppositional difference, I think, has to do in different views of, of persons. And traditionally, libertarians, I think, have had a fairly uncomplicated view, at least they did back when I was reading Conscience of a Conservative, as individuals as possessing free will and being responsible for acting upon it. Um, whereas I think liberals have a fundamentally Maslowian view of the person and the idea that their foundational needs and that um, political and civil liberties are terribly important, but until these foundational needs are met, the need for security, the need for food, and the need for basic economic support, the um, capacity to act economically and, and politically um, isn't going to be there. And, and I thought, Will, that you were going to embrace that when you were inveighing against the um, the, self, the inequality road to serfdom, but then in the end you came out for a guaranteed annual income. So it may be that that isn't a difference anymore, anymore either. So let me see if I can find one difference and go back to something that I think Paul started with, Paul Starr started with, um, which is the, the view of um, government um, as the source of, of the greatest threat to human liberty. Um, the Libertarian Party platform of 2008, I, I have no idea what real libertarians think of the Libertarian Party these days, but um, we, they, right, we defend each person's right to engage in any activity that is peaceful and honest and welcome the diversity that freedom brings. The world we seek to build is one where individuals are free to follow their own dreams in their own ways without interference from government or from any authoritarian power. And I think the problem is that, that many libertarians, at least up to now, have often f forgotten those last three words, or any authoritarian power. One of the things that I do academically is I study formal organizations. And I think if you read Max Weber or, or just about any of the empirical literature, you know that large organizations always try to um, maintain and accumulate power and never are terribly concerned with the liberties of the rights or rights of the people who um, they have power over. And I think that is true systemically of large private bureaucracies as it is of large government bureaucracies. Now, you can say that large government bureaucracies have a, a monopoly over coercion, so we need to worry about them a little more. And I think that's probably right in the long run. But in the short run, um, in a liberal uh, constitutional society, there are also more checks and balances, or at least there have been until recently, on government um, power and relatively few on, on the power of large private bureaucracies, which are even um, required to repress the rights of employees and citizens as long as they do so legally if it's in the interest of their shareholders. Um, 
But so I'd like to, to make two arguments. One is, is fairly trivial, and it's that private bureaucracies can also, as can government, serve as, as agents to limit the liberties of individuals. But the other, I think, is more important, and it hasn't come up yet, which is that large private bureaucracies often and perhaps increasingly serve as agents of states that seek to abridge fundamental human liberties, and the fact the private and the public have become analytically inseparable. And let me just give a couple of examples from the field in which I'm teaching um, internet policy. There's a debate over something called net neutrality, which is a, it's, it's a complicated issue and tends to be obfuscated, but basically the, the issue is whether um, the internet, which is a network of networks, it was designed so that the intelligence would be at the endpoints. The intelligence would be in the computers of the people sending information and the people receiving it. Should be um, modified to put more discretion and more intelligence in, in the pipes that transmit the um, information from the beginning to the, uh, the endpoint. Um, some liberals and many civil, some conservatives and even some libertarians tend to oppose net neutrality because they think the government should be, um, the, uh, the system should be allowed to work and the market should be allowed to work. Um, some liberals and many civil libertarians support net neutrality for two reasons. They fear that the ISPs, the internet service providers like Comcast and Verizon, um, may use their control over networks to block free expression. But more important, they fear that even if the ISPs are politically neutral, big firms like Google and Amazon and the media companies will turn the internet into a platform for streaming video and the little guys, the um, Cato Institutes, the, the public interest organizations, the activist organizations, the intellectual fora, um, will be consigned to the sort of cattle car class um, service for the transmission of their packets, and it'll just be hard for them to get through, or it'll be slower for people to have access to their um, material. I think both groups have a point, but they're both missing an important point, and that's that if you build intelligence into the pipes of a system like the internet, if you enable ISPs, to sniff at packets, to identify their source or their content as they flow through the system, the same technology that corporations need to engage in legal price discrimination, legal so far, can be used by government for illegal spying. Now this has happened in China. China is the poster child for the ability of commercial systems to be used by government to constrain the, the free um, exchange of information in civil society. Um, interestingly enough, and this is something I learned from one of my students, uh, the legislation to censor China for this and to censor some of the corporations that have been enabling the Chinese government is very much opposed by the NSA and the CIA and the FBI, um, in part because the very same technologies that the censurers would like to um, uh, criticize when they're exported to China are the ones that are needed in the U.S. not just for the commercial interests of the ISP so that they can discriminate between dis different classes of traffic on, for commercial reasons, but also by um, state agencies that want to be able to spy on, on citizens and, and restrict our, our rights. And I think we see other things, examples of that in copyright law where the law is structured in a way which creates interests for ISPs that lead them to be um, very aggressive in pursuing what they perceive to be copyright infringements by um, services that they host, sometimes with, with very anti-free expression results. And also in the area of privacy, where large companies like Google and others aggregate um, individual data, turn it into something that's, that's useful for commercial exchange, but also produce data sets that government can then appropriate um, to invade privacy and, and engage in, in um, activities that are, that are uh, threatened civil liberties. The final point I'd like to ask, just as a question, is where cyber libertarianism fits into this. I mean, I think cyber libertarians haven't, I don't know that they've generated any great political philosophers yet, but I think they represent a brand of libertarianism that in a sense um, is, are like liberals in that they believe that the commons problem is a very big problem, um, but like conservatives in they believe that you don't need the state to solve it. And they seem to be sort of a combination of, of Hayek and Prince Kropotkin. And you know, I wonder where they fit in the overall mosaic. So. <laughs> Well, listening to the discussion today reminds me of, uh, of something that uh, the communist Chinese premier Deng Xiaoping once said <laughs> when he was uh, first beginning to attempt to steer the massive ship of the Chinese state away from a command economy and towards a market economy. Of course, he got uh, a lot of pushback from the Maoists. And, and, uh, 
He looked him right in the eye and said, I don't care what color the cat is, as long as it catches mice. <laughs> and I think that that's probably a good summary for where we end up today. Now, normally we might have some questions, but we're uh, well beyond the hour. So what I uh, invite you to do is to join us for reception in the Schultz um, uh, cafeteria right around the corner where there'll be refreshments. We can drink the three cups deeply and see <laughs> the degree to which our differences are indeed soluble in alcohol. <laughs>